Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for coming out to uh, tonight's uh, lecture by uh, Dr. Ross Dixon. Uh, and also, I hope you have a chance, if you haven't been upstairs uh, to Love North, to see the exhibit. Um, it, it'll be there till the end of the semester. Um, so if you have time tonight, go see it if you haven't already, or sometime when you're cruising through campus, uh, stop in, stop in and, and visit the, the exhibit. That's uh, the reason for this talk. So um, Dr. Dixon joined the faculty uh, uh, at UNL uh, January a year ago. He's been here for a little over a year now. Um, he's a regional climate modeler, and uh, that's the reason we recruited and hired him. Uh, Ross uh, spent, uh, well, I should start, I guess, at the beginning, right? Not that far back, but um, <laughs> Ross got his bachelor's degree and master's degree in physics and atmospheric physics, uh, respectively, at uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, uh, and then went on to the University of Wisconsin for his PhD, which you received in 2017, right? That's right. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> then he spent uh, two and a half years at the National Center for Meteorological Research in Toulouse, France. I didn't try to pronounce the French name for the center because that would just be awful for everybody. Um, and uh, then after he finished that, uh, he happened to, he stopped by Lincoln and interviewed for his job and then went on to another postdoc at the University of Arizona uh, before he came back for the faculty position uh, in January of, of 2021. So. Uh, Ross is going to talk today uh, about uh, climate models and how we use climate models to project future climates for Earth. So without any further ado. Thanks for that kind introduction, Clint. Um, and thank you all for coming out tonight. I know the weather might not be the, the nicest tonight, so I really appreciate you coming out um, to, for my talk. Uh, as he said, I'm, I'm Ross. I'm... Uh, really interested in climate dynamics, atmospheric dynamics, and climate modeling. So it's a real pleasure to be here tonight to tell you a bit about what computer models can tell us about Earth's future climate. Oh, we uh, need to click here, there we go. We live in a changing world. You might be aware of this. Uh, this figure here comes from the most recent IPCC report, which was released last summer from the first working group. And it shows change in time for several different parts of the um, Earth system. So at the, for example, at the top here, we've got uh, the atmosphere. Uh, one important component is the carbon dioxide concentration. And so here we've got an increase, a dramatic increase in uh, CO2 concentration with time. In the cryosphere, there's observed glacial mass loss in the, the recent past, um, the ocean is increasing in heat content. We see sea levels rising. All of these things are connected, uh, especially through global surface temperature, which we can see warming in these colors. Uh, blue colors are, are cooler here. Red colors are warmer. And I really want to focus down here into this global surface temperature. Let's look at this this data in a different lens. This might be easier for some people to, to picture. We've got uh, changes in global surface temperature on the y-axis here relative to the 1850 to 1900 period. And what's been observed in these observational records is uh, around one degree Celsius of warming since that period, which ends in 1900. Uh, and if we extend our record back 2,000 years using proxy data for temperature from ice cores, um, uh, tree rings, and, and other records which we can derive temperature from, we can see that this warming is unprecedented in more than 2,000 years. Right? Right. This, is, this is a global signal that we can observe in, in the climate record. This is another way of looking at these global temperature changes. I don't know if, if uh, you've seen these before. This was, a, was called the warming stripes. Um, this was put together by Ed Hawkins. And it's essentially the exact same data from 
this figure here. <laughs> um, but we've put the warming colors, right, colors that are a, a, a positive on a figure like this in red and ones that are negative in blue. The averaging is done over a slightly different period. So you're going to see red and blue in slightly different places. But the signal is clear warming towards the end of this time series, uh, dramatic warming. In the next couple of slides, I want to flip through and think about going to uh, smaller and smaller regions, because when you think about it, uh, it's really important to think about what global temperature change is going to be, but it's even more important to think about what the change that's happening in your own area is, right? No one, no one wakes up and says, well, you know, I really noticed that the global temperature was a little bit warmer. What they notice is how temperature is changing for them. So this is what a similar plot looks like for the entirety of the United States since uh, 19, uh, sorry, 1895. And what we see is the same pattern warming towards the end of the record, but there's more noise here, right? There's uh, a lot more variability in the year-to-year -year variations in warm and, and cooler years. And this continues as we look at the state of Nebraska. And, this, and so you can see the same signal warming towards the end of the record but there's some really, really strong warm years towards the earlier period, some cool years mixed in here. Uh, this is kind of highlighting how understanding regional climate is a serious challenge <laughs> um, and is, is so important for understanding human impacts. If you really enjoyed these visualizations, make sure you come by uh, Adele Hall Learning Commons on April 27th from 3 to 5 p.m. The uh, library is helping organize some uh, visual uh, te tapestries, um, woven visualizations of texture using yarn. Uh, and I'm, I'm super excited about this. I've seen some examples from the past and, and this is gonna be a really cool activity. I'm, I'm definitely planning on, on swinging by. Okay, so this is what these global uh, um, warming stripes look like and regional, global, national, regional warming stripes look like. What are some other important observed signals observe changes in climate. We can think about precipitation changes. So this is an image taken from the third national climate assessment. Uh, and what I want to draw your eye to in this figure is that there's a lot more spatial variability here in terms of the green colors, which represent an increase in precipitation in terms of percent uh, here, and the brown regions, which is a drying, a, a decrease in precipitation. And what they've done here in this um, climate assessment is separated the United States down into further regions and created these bar graphs. Here we see the United States average um, with each of these bars representing a single decade and each of these different regions. So you might be interested in finding a region that's of particular interest to you. My eye is drawn, of course, to uh, Midwest, where I lived for a, a good amount of time, and of course, the Great Plains North, where I I currently am, uh, and we see that for several of these regions, there has been an increase in precipitation in the last century. Perhaps a more important thing to look at is a change in heavy precipitation. Because these extreme precipitation events are um, of particular interest to human impacts, flooding, all right? Um, uh, uh, signals that really have strong implications for human health and well-being. So if we think about these indices for very heavy precipitation, we can see that there's also a tendency for there to be an increase in these heavy precipitation events um, in the observed changes in climate. Precipitation, temperature, these are important for agriculture as well. I wanted to show you this figure of hardiness zones produced by the National Arbor Day Foundation. If there are any uh, gardeners in the room, I'm sure you're familiar with how important uh, the understanding of the, the hardiness is, right? The lower numbers, the, the cooler colors indicate regions where the, the winters are cold and you can't overwinter plants, um, a certain plants. And what we see between 1990 and 2015, is that these 
hardiness zones have shifted northward, <laughs> meaning that winters aren't as cold and harsh as they were. Uh, as, uh, have a look at Nebraska, where in 1990 there was a lot of blue and green, and in 2015 uh, it's pretty much all green now. <laughs> right? What are some of the other sort of human implications? Why, why do we care about these changes that we see in the, the climatic record? Well, these are just a couple of news articles I grabbed from the last couple of days as I was preparing this talk. We've got Lake Powell's water level plummeting due to the extreme mega drought that's being seen in the Southwest um, that has a, a, a fingerprint from uh, anthropogenic climate change. Climate change has challenges to the Outer Banks Barrier Islands. Um, so a very a lot of economic sort of decisions to be made here. Heat waves at both of Earth's poles alarm climate scientists. This has just been going on the last several days. This is very interesting and uh, terrifying signals that are being seen. Um, and of course, the IPCC is discussing new reports and, and new information and suggestions for policy that will be coming out uh, in the next couple of weeks. And if you have want to explore more about different observed signals and human implications, would highly recommend you check out the traveling exhibit. I'm sorry, this is really driving me crazy. Um, um, yeah, can I perhaps just use the... Thank you. Is, is that all right? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it was driving some of you crazy as well. <laughs> um, I would highly recommend checking out the exhibit on the second floor of the Love Library. We'll be here through the end of the semester called Real People, Real Climate, Real Changes. It's a traveling exhibit that was put together by the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, and it digs into some of these ideas uh, a little bit further. But what I, where I want to go is what are the causes of these observed changes in climate? Okay, right? We've seen that there's observational evidence for these changes. What's causing them? And so I want to start with this image, which is a time series uh, of carbon dioxide concentration in parts per million taken at the Mauna Loa Observatory. It's a great place to get a good record of well-mixed carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because it's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, right? <laughs> uh, away from a lot of major sources uh, of carbon dioxide. And what we can see in this figure is since they've started taking records back in 1958, nice long-term record, uh, carbon dioxide concentration has increased from around 315 parts per million all the way up to over 420. This is a really large increase in carbon dioxide. And this is driven by burning of fossil fuels, anthropogenic causes. You burn fossil fuels for energy and um, greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide, are emitted. Um, so what does this have to do with temperature? Uh, the third national climate assessment put together this, this cool figure where we see a, uh, this solid curve is our carbon dioxide concentration placed on top of the changes in global temperature. And so you can probably see that there is some sort of similarity in these two signals. Uh, and you might be thinking, well, well, what if that's just a coincidence? Um, so in order to really connect anthropogenic uh, human emissions of CO2 to temperature change, we can run climate simulations and force them with just natural forcings and different human forcings. So that's what's shown in this figure. We have global surface temperature change since 19, uh, sorry, 1850 on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And the observations, you've already seen this black curve a couple times in this talk. We see this increase of around one degree Celsius since the beginning of this record. And what's shown in the colors are model simulations of the global temperature with different forcings applied. So this green curve here only has forcings from natural causes, forcings like volcanic activity, changes in solar activity, sunspots, et cetera, right? So 
when we look at the green curve, we aren't able to reproduce the observed record. We need to add human um, forcings from human activity into our global climate models if we want to reproduce the observed temperature record. And this includes the emission of greenhouse gases, which are shown in the red here. This has a tendency to warm the, the, the global um, climate. And aerosols, particles which are also created during the combustion part process, which reflect energy and result in a cooling of the climate system. And if we put all of these things together, natural causes and human, we end up being able to reproduce well the observed warming pattern. We can use these simulations to think about future projections of climate. So this figure here shows temperature, uh, global surface temperature on the y-axis and projecting these temperature changes into the future for several different emission scenarios, right? What are choices we make now in terms of how much carbon we're going to put into the atmosphere are going to have implications for how much warmer the climate system is going to get. So if we're able to curb our emissions, perhaps we can keep warming to one to two degrees Celsius. But if we continue to emit at higher, very high levels, we're thinking more um, around, more, around five uh, degrees Celsius by the end of the century. And, but I, I bet some of you are thinking to yourself, well, hold up. The last couple of slides have relied completely on model simulations. <laughs> Why must we rely on computer models? Well, we only have one Earth. There is no second Earth. So there's no way for us to, you know, set up another Earth and, and say, well, let's, uh, let's change the, the carbon dioxide concentration in it and see how that planet changes, right? There's no planet B no second earth, there's no way to run controlled experiments. The goal of climate modeling is to think about representing the earth system. Um, it is to think about representing the earth system as accurately as possible. These simulations are not earth, <laughs> but the goal is to create simulations that best represent earth so that we can investigate many different climate scenarios. So this is what I really wanna talk about in this talk. What are the fundamental concepts in climate science and how do we use them to build useful models of global and regional climate? And I wanna start with a very simple model and think about after we build this model, you'll be aware of three things that control the equilibrium temperature of a planet. The first one is how much solar energy arrives at the planet how much of that energy is reflected back into space, and how much of the energy that that planet emits is absorbed by its atmosphere and trapped. So the simple model we're going to create is just a simple energy balance model. This is a model for uh, the average temperature of the planet. So we're thinking about a average over the entire planet, which is gonna have some sort of surface and a surface temperature T sub S. And then we're gonna consider the energy coming into this system and the energy leaving the system. And we're going to equate them. Energy in equals energy going out. Think of this like your bank account, right? If you have money coming in and money going out and those things are equal, your savings doesn't change at all. <laughs> um, and so in this situation, if we have energy in is balanced with energy going out, our surface temperature is going to have an equilibrium. So what are the sources of energy in for this simple model? What's the source of energy that, that, um, that, that warms the, the planet? Well, it's energy from the sun. The sun produces a tremendous amount of energy and the planet intercepts some of it. <laughs> um, and so we're just gonna call that F sub S here. This is the uh, say energy flux of the sun. Um, this value changes if the sun has different amounts of um, solar activity and outputs more or less energy. This number also changes as the orbit of the earth changes and gets closer or further from the sun at a 100,000 year uh, time cycle. 
So of that energy, some of it is absorbed by the surface and some of it is reflected back into space. This is a satellite image of the earth, which shows that there are a lot of climate features which are light and reflective clouds and ice and snow. And those aerosols that I was talking about in the earlier figure that are um, often emitted by combustion and volcanic activity, these things reflect incoming solar radiation back into space. This is the albedo of the planet. So we represented this with a letter A times our solar flux here. And the final thing we have to consider in this model is energy that's being emitted by the planet, right? So some of this energy from the sun is absorbed and warms the surface, the surface has a temperature. All things that have a temperature emit radiation. <laughs> and it goes to the, the, the amount of energy that's emitted is proportional to temperature to the fourth power. So that's what's represented here. And so now we've got these three different um, energy fluxes. We can do our energy in equals energy out and come up with this equation. You, you don't need to worry about what this equation <laughs> um, says, but I wanted to put it here so that you all know that I'm just not making this stuff up. We know what the solar flux is. We can measure that. We can measure what the albedo of the planet is. And so we're able to compute the temperature of this system, the surface temperature, and we get a number of 255 Kelvin. We like to use Kelvin uh, in, in science, right? Because the absolute, uh, sorry, sorry, the zero point is absolute. <laughs> um, but I've also placed the temperatures here in Celsius and Fahrenheit. We have negative 18 degrees Celsius and zero degrees Fahrenheit. So what's the problem here? This is this is really cold. <laughs> Life on this planet would not exist as we know it um, if, if this was the temperature. So what aren't we including in this model? We didn't include the fact that our planet has an atmosphere. So if we enter just a simple slab atmosphere, which absorbs all of that outgoing radiation from the surface and then re-emits it to space and back down towards the surface, we can do this energy balance again, and we find that we have an equilibrium temperature of 303 Kelvin, or around 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, this is too hot. <laughs> it ends up that the atmosphere doesn't absorb all of the outgoing radiation from the surface. It only absorbs part of it, and if you take that into account, then you're able to get much closer to what the observed temperature of the planet is. And of course, how much of the radiation that's outgoing is observed is absorbed by the atmosphere depends on the constituents of the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide, water vapor, or greenhouse gases. This is the atmospheric greenhouse effect, which causes the surface of the planet to be warmer than it would be if there was no atmosphere. So to go back to this idea, the three things that control the equilibrium temperature of a planet, how much solar energy arrives at the planet, are sunspots, the orbit of the planet, how much of that energy is reflected back into space, ice, snow, clouds, these aerosols, and then finally, how much of the energy that the planet emits is absorbed by the atmosphere and trapped. This is our atmospheric greenhouse effect that depends on the composition of the atmosphere. So you're probably thinking, oh, and, and this, is, this is not a new idea, right? We've <laughs> been using these simple energy balance models for over 100 years. Here's a paper by Arrhenius on the influence of carbonic acid in the air upon the temperature of the ground. Carbonic acid is our carbon dioxide here. Um, and so this is, this is not a new idea. And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, that's great that we have a simple model for the global temperature, but the planet doesn't have the same temperature everywhere. <laughs> this is something that, that you're probably thinking of, well, how useful is this model really? So let's think about expanding this model and thinking about um, spatial variations in temperature. So here's a map that shows that the tropics are warmer in the 
um, the, the warmer colors and the poles are cooler and the cooler colors. So let's see if we can create a simple model that will allow us to reproduce this temperature distribution. And so we're just going to think about this temperature distribution latitudinally by thinking about just averaging across the, the horizontal direction on this plot here, the zonal direction. Here's a latitudinal plot of energy in and energy out. What we see is the energy in, there's a lot more energy in in the tropical regions than in the polar regions. This is due to the curvature of the Earth. And energy out has a much flatter curve, right? It's depending on temperature, that T to the fourth relationship. So in the tropics, there's a lot more energy in than energy out. There's an energy surplus here. And in the polar regions, there's a lot more energy out than energy in. You have an energy deficit. And if there wasn't anything that was able to rearrange <laughs> um, energy on the planet, what would end up happening is that the tropics would just get warmer and warmer and warmer, and the, the poles would get colder and colder and colder until they were extremely cold, <laughs> and the tropics were extremely warm. But fortunately, there is energy transport from the tropics to the poles, north and south energy transport by atmospheric and oceanic motions. This is the general circulation of the atmosphere and ocean. Um, and you, know, you could spend an entire course uh, thinking about the complexities of the general circulation of the planet. But what I want us to think about is just a simple sort of transport of energy between latitudinal bands. And we can think about breaking the system up into discrete regions, right? Create a bunch of columns here. And for each of these columns, we're going to consider energy in, energy out, and transport in the north-south direction. This is a latitudinally dependent energy balance model. Uh, and this was a technique that was used in the late 1960s. This is one, uh, one paper that produced a model like this. Uh, William Sellers, a global climatic model based on the energy balance of the Earth atmosphere system. I wanted to show just one of the pages from this paper. This is the whole model, <laughs> okay? So this is, we've gone from one equation to a page of equations. And when you use this equation, the dots here are the output from this model compared with the line, which is observations. It reproduces the latitudinal distribution of temperatures really well. And at this point, you're probably thinking, okay, well, is this much better? We, we now have, uh, an idea of going from a global to now we've got different latitude bands. How can we continue to add complexity to this system? What about cool things that like convection and clouds and storms? How are these things, how might we represent these processes in a model? And so I grabbed this image. This is over um, some islands in Indonesia. We see clouds and convection, upward motion, uh, there's uh, precipitation, I'm sure, occurring under some of these. Um, how do we split this sort of system into areas which we can model? We can't just take this continuous system and uh, model every particle, every little bit of this system. We have to think about breaking this domain into some sort of grid, just like we just took that latitudinal domain and sliced it into latitude bands. We're going to take this horizontal domain and split it into different boxes. And what you'll notice is that I've outlined uh, regions of uh, around 100 kilometers. This is around the resolution of um, the current climate models, global models. And what you'll notice is that there's a lot of stuff that is happening at a smaller resolution than that 100 kilometer grid box. Right? Some of these boxes have, um, you know, are all ocean, but some of them have some land and some ocean, right? We've got some that have these small, uh, lower level clouds. Some of them have a large amount of convection, but it's only confined to half of the. How do we think about taking these complex things, which are happening at scales smaller than the grid that we're modeling, um, and represent them properly? And these are what's known as our parameterizations in models. And a useful tool for developing them and understanding how 
um, how they represent different processes in the climate system is a single column model. So we're just going to think about taking one of these grid boxes, here I've outlined this one in yellow, and creating a vertical column of boxes. This is a single column model. You know, consider the, the globe here, and then taking just a region and just one place in that region and building a vertical model um, for, for, uh, the, that, um, for, for the atmosphere. This was uh, a, a, a very popular tool in the early stages of model development. This is a very famous paper by Manabe and Weatherall, where they use a single column model and they apply various changes, uh, which I've outlined in red here, changing the solar constant, changing carbon dioxide concentrations, ozone concentrations, and cloudiness. And why do you think they chose these things to change in the model? These are the three knobs <laughs> that we discovered were important forcing, for, um, important drivers of climate in our energy balance model, right? We've got the solar constant. This is energy in from the sun. We've got cloudiness, which has to do with that albedo, the reflection of, of energy back into space. And we've got constituents such as CO2, ozone, which um, are important for the greenhouse effect. And what they were able to show is changing is how vertical temperature profiles. So here we've got temperature along the x-axis and um, height along the y-axis, how these temperature profiles changed when you were to alter these different drivers of, um, of, of climate. And this one here is for carbon dioxide with the, the triangle line here with is 150 parts per million and the circles 600 and we see cooling in the stratosphere, and warming in the troposphere and that these signals were much stronger when you were able to take moisture feedbacks into account. And these this is a very simple model, right? <laughs> that has that energy balance, but also some simple representation of convection. And for the work that uh, Manabe and, and others did in the 60s for the physical, for developing physical modeling of Earth's climate, quantifying variability and reliably predicting global warming, he was awarded with with other researchers, the Nobel Prize in Physics just last year. So this is really important uh, work that was done. So we've gone from a global model for climate, a latitudinal model for climate, a very local one, a single column model for climate. How do we go back to a full global model, which is perhaps more complicated? Well, if you can imagine a single column you might be able to imagine lots and lots of columns that are all next to each other. So our global Earth system model, the atmospheric component is going to consist of a lot of these columns, right, which are able to exchange uh, energy and, and mass um, in the vertical direction, in the horizontal direction, turning the Earth into a gridded space. Um, And so there, so, so we've gone from, from something that is, well, yeah, yeah, kind of simple to something that's much more complex. Here are all the different things, not all, not all of them. This is a sum of the important things that need to be considered when you're developing a global Earth system model. We no longer call them climate models because we're trying to capture all of the important components of the Earth system. For example, the ocean circulation, deep ocean circulation, ocean ice, snow, and aspects of the biosphere, which are important for, for climate, convective clouds, stratiform clouds, these aerosols, right, in the stratosphere and the troposphere that I was talking about, fluxes between all these different components. Um, and of course, the constituents, which are important for radiation and that forcing that we were just talking about, water vapor, CO2, greenhouse gases. And so here's a schematic. So what does this actually look like when you, you put together a, a climate model? Here is the schematic for the community Earth system model. This is the model that's developed at NCAR. Um, 
and a lot of scientists have been working for a long time on developing this model. Here are just all the different components in it. We have atmosphere, sea ice, land ice, the ocean, river runoff, land, and of course, biogeochemistry, the importance of life. Um, and all of these are coupled together. This code is, or at least it was as of several years ago, 1.5 million lines of code. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it is many more lines now. So we went from a single equation to a page of equations. So now we're talking about a model which is millions of lines of code in order to try to represent all of the processes in the Earth system which are important for understanding past, present, and future climate. So you're probably thinking to yourself, well, this is probably an extremely computationally expensive thing to run, and you would be correct. This is the machine that's being used at NCAR right now. This is Cheyenne. It's a computer that's able to do 5.34 petaflops. This is, is fun to say. What is a petaflop? Well, a flop is a floating point operation per second. So, and, and peta is um, a quadrillion, or 10 to the 15th, a quadrillion, so 5.34 quadrillion calculations per second. In 2016, when it was put online, it was the 20th most powerful supercomputer in the world. And currently, it's about to be replaced by an even stronger machine known as, uh, an even faster machine known as Derecho, which is around just under 20 petaflops, an incredible amount of computing power. We are fortunate here at UNL to have the Holland Computing Center, which also has some very strong high performance computing equipment. The machine here is 1.2, one petaflops, which is less, but it's, it's nothing to sneeze at. Um, this is a really powerful resource and I run simulations on, on this machine. And if you're interested in high performance computing would highly recommend checking uh, out their, their different courses and, um, and, and find, figure out ways to, to learn more about, about this. So where are these Earth system models being developed and run? Uh, this figure here shows all the different modeling groups which have contributed simulations to the coupled model intercomparison mo project. All of these different places are developing and running their own climate simulations, just like the CSM, but they've used different techniques to represent these um, subgrid scale processes and large scale dynamics. Um, but they run these simulations all with the same sort of experiment, the same type of forcing. So then they can be compared. And this is important because like I said, none of these simulations are Earth. They're all Earth-like planets. They're all <laughs> the, they're our attempt to create a simulation which is as close to Earth as possible. So instead of relying on just one, it's important for us to have a large number of these simulations to think about what might, um, what might occur in the future. So what, are these, what does this ensemble of simulations show for the future? One way we can think about this is by breaking the Earth down into different regions. This is new in the most recent IPCC report. Uh, just taking the Earth and turning it into a bunch of regions, and then thinking about how many of those regions have high or medium confidence in the change and increase or decrease in different uh, climatic drivers that we're interested in. For example, mean surface temperature, extreme heat, um, heavy precipitation and flooding, hydrological drought. A and so what we can see in this chart over here is that these ones which are associated with temperature, there are a lot more regions with high or medium confidence in an increase or decrease in our future projections than for some of these which are more focused on precipitation. For example, mean precipitation, hydrological drought, um, agricultural, ecological drought. The, there's a lot more uncertainty in these simulations in terms of precipitation change. So what do I mean by uncertainty? Because this is what my research is really about, is understanding regional 
uncertainty in projections of climate. Um, and so here's a figure from a recent paper showing the ensemble mean precipitation change for a large number of these CMIP models from the end of this century minus a historical period. The green colors show where precipitation is expected to increase and the brown colors show where it's expected to decrease. But this, this hatching that goes across here indicates regions where models agree, where the, um, the sign of the change in many of these simulations is the same. And so I went to the, the uh, CMEP archive and grabbed a bunch of these simulations. And just for this region across the central part of the United States and, and Mexico, I just plotted a couple of profiles of these individual model ensembles. So that's what's being shown from 20 degrees to 50 degrees north along this axis. Uh, the, just the change in precipitation at the end of the century. And what we can see is that in the southern part of the domain, there is this decrease in precipitation, right? These brown colors here and the hatching, which shows that the models are in good agreement. And in the northern part, we have an increase in precipitation and hatching, which shows that most of the models are in agreement. But we have a lot of disagreement in terms of where um, the models are saying there might be an increase or decrease in this transitionary region around 30 degrees north, right? Where there's not a lot of hash marks uh, in this plot. And so the question is, well, if you have, if you're growing crops in that region and you're interested in what the precipitation change might be in the next uh, uh, few decades, how do we think about understanding this uncertainty? And this is a really challenging problem because precipitation change is forced by a lot of different things. In reality, it can be forced by changes in large scale circulation patterns, changes in regional circulation patterns, different boundary conditions, land usage change. And then of course, the local physics, how clouds um, and convection change. And in the model, we have all these things. This is, I put commas here instead of plus because this is all very nonlinear and these are all interacting with each other. In the model, we have the same things, but we have slight errors and biases in all these fields. So to understand model precipitation change, we have to consider all of these different forcings for regional precipitation change. And in my research, I like to use a large variety of model complexities to think about this problem, ranging from single column simulations to two-dimensional simulations, even using aquaplanets, basically taking a global model and removing all land. Land is a source of complexity. <laughs> so if you can remove some complexity from a simulation, it might be easier to understand um, different drivers of these regional precipitation changes, all the way up to using global climate models uh, to run ex design and run experiments to think about controls on local precipitation. And I wanted to show you just one example from my research. This is using a two-dimensional model to understand drivers of regional climate. One of the regions of research that I'm very interested in is West African climate. Here we've got a satellite image from August of 20, uh, 2006. And this is during the, the height of the monsoon season. We can see the Saharan desert here. And of course, uh, green across the Sahel, this boundary, the lower boundary of the Saharan desert where precipitation falls for three months of the year. Uh, and the, the people who live in this region are highly dependent on that monsoonal precipitation. So a major question is, how is that precipitation going to change as climate changes? And it's a complicated region. <laughs> the precipitation in this region is impacted by processes across the Saharan, a, a Saharan desert, a, a low level pattern, a low level uh, a low pressure circulation pattern, which develops due to the hot temperatures there. Regional circulations, driven by gradients in sea surface temperature and the temperature across the Guinean coast, large scale circulations, 
land surface properties. It's a very complicated region of the world. So how do we think about understanding how precipitation might change? One um, approach has been to create a two-dimensional model. So this is thinking about that latitudinally dependent energy model, but just for this region that goes across West Africa. So we're just taking a, a north-south um, and, and vertical transect across the region, and we're going to use that and force it with these different large-scale and regional circulation patterns to see how changing each of these individually and then all together changes precipitation in the region. And so uh, there's a lot going on. This is, this is a plot that I actually took from one of my publications. So I'm gonna slowly walk you through, don't freak out, okay? Um, <laughs> these plots are showing precipitation change with increased sea surface temperature. So here we have these latitudes from uh, 10 degrees south to 25 degrees north, taking that north-south transect across West Africa. And on the, uh, the y-axis here, we have precipitation. This black contour shows precipitation for full global climate simulations. And we see what we expect, right? That precipitation uh, for the month of August is heavy across the, the Guinean coast and Sahel region tapers off here at the edge of the Sahara. However, if we warm sea surface temperatures everywhere by four degrees Celsius, that's what's shown in the blue curve. And what we see in that precipitation pattern is a decrease in precipitation and a shift of precipitation towards the south. So this is a really interesting signal. What makes precipitation shift to the south and decrease? And so with our two-dimensional model, we were able to separate out regional changes in the circulation and large-scale changes in the circulation and apply them separately and together. So that's what's shown in the second plot here. We have latitude along the x-axis in the same manner and precipitation along the y-axis. Our control simulation is shown in black here. It produces a similar, a similar pattern in precipitation as shown in these full three-dimensional models. When we apply just a regional forcing to this model by just changing sea surface temperatures and seeing what circulation changes due to that, we get a southward shift in the precipitation, but also an increase <laughs> in the precipitation. When we only apply large-scale forcing without changing any of the regional circulation pattern, we're able to see a decrease in the precipitation, but not that southward shift in the blue line here. It's only when we combine the regional and large-scale forcings together, we're able to reproduce the signal that's seen in the full three uh, 3D model, shown in this orange line here. And so this gives us some information about what is causing the southward shift in the precipitation band and what is causing the decrease. It's two different things. The regional forcing is really responsible for the southward shift, and the large-scale forcing is responsible for that decrease. And in this paper, we were able to go through and think about more dynamical mechanisms in terms of moisture transport and temperature transport uh, that were associated with these two different drivers of the regional climate to really understand what processes were resulting in this very interesting signal we see in the full 3D model. So I hope this has given you an idea of uh, how models of varying complexity can be useful for understanding regional climate. I just wanted to mention one other type of simulation, uh, which I'm getting into. This is something that is a little bit new for me, but I'm thinking about regional climate modeling in terms of running regional climate models. <laughs> um, these are models which are only run for a regional domain. And in this figure, we see some global climate model output. This is our standard 100 kilometer output from the, the simulations I was discussing earlier. These are global simulations. But this other figure here to, on the right shows uh, the output from a simulation which is just for 
the central US region. These simulations were actually done by an undergraduate student, uh, Ali Berry, who worked with me on a UCARE project last summer. And what you can see is that these have a much higher resolution and you can do different things about how we force them from the boundary conditions to really think about running innovative experiments to increase understanding of climate dynamics and understand the projection uh, of uncertainty into the future. They're also useful for creating high resolution outputs, which are useful for driving impact models, flooding and agriculture. So this is a new direction of my research, which I'm very excited about. There's a lot of knowledge here at UNL about regional climate modeling. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be here and, and starting to work on projects like this. So in summary, hopefully what you've gotten from this talk is an appreciation <laughs> for, for some knowledge and appreciation about how climate modelers think about developing models from the simplest models to the most complex. And the importance of understanding the differences between global and regional climate. Um, and I've come away with the idea that computer models are useful tools for understanding changes in global and regional climate. After all, we only have one planet to work with here, right? So we need to use these simulations and we need to consider how the choices we are making are going to end up with forcing climates of the future, which someone is going to have to deal with. And I know something I didn't mention in this talk <laughs> is thinking about solutions uh, and approaches to solving this idea of, of um, uh, climate change. But I wanted to, to um, advertise a, fortunately, <laughs> there is a, um, what is this, a virtual event that's occurring next week on March 30th um, for the Solve Climate by 2030 organization on campus and would highly recommend checking that out if you're interested in thinking about solutions to climate change. Um, and so if you're a student or a member of the community and you have some further questions about climate, um, modeling climate change, or are interested in taking courses or doing research about climate change, feel free to email me, uh, contact me. I'd be glad to answer your questions or, or talk about different opportunities that might be available. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, and would be glad to take questions. If there's a question, I'll bring the mic to you so we can record the question as well. So don't be shy. Enjoyed the talk, Ross. Thanks. Um, so it seems like I read that when people are trying to do a shorter range, like extending the standard weather forecast from, you know, the six to seven days to two weeks to one month or whatever, there, there is, is there a, in terms of computational power, are there commonalities to weather forecasting and the kind of long range projections that you're making? Yeah, so, so in terms of thinking about what computation is needed for um, these shorter scale for shorter scale forecasts um, and, and longer scale, they, they are, the, the fundamentals are the same, <laughs> but there are a lot of differences in terms of how these models are set up. What really needs to be considered if you want a really good forecast of weather or uh, even a seasonal forecast compared to these longer time, time scale. The, the time scale has a lot to do with it. These, to run these simulations on a climatological timescale for hundreds of years, this is when you start getting into uh, a lot of computational expense. So even though um, weather models can often be run at these higher, higher resolutions, it's because they're being done for much shorter periods. That's a great question, thank you. Um, you did a very good job. And also my question is, if us as humans continue to do the same things that we have been doing, 
how do you see the conclusion ending? <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> um, yeah, so it is true that it can be rather depressing being a climate scientist. Uh, there's a lot of signals that are extremely troubling. Um, but there's also a lot of um, human ingenuity and, and resilience. So it's, it's a hard question. It, it depends on whether I'm feeling <laughs> being an optimist or a pessimist uh, in the day. But, but ultimately, we need to think about how to stop emitting carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and think about developing technologies to remove greenhouse gases, right? People come up to me and say, oh, you're a climate scientist. You're going to solve climate change. N no, that's, that's not really my job. My job is to think about understanding how that climate change is going to impact people. Where I, where I have hope, and I know that there's a lot of debate and discussion about this, but that perhaps technology might be able to lend a hand. But uh, we've been saying this for a long time now. So. Thank you for that question. And on that note, <laughs> thank you again for coming out tonight. Um, yeah. I, really, I really appreciate your presence. And if you have other questions, feel free to email me or, or come up and ask. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you again, Ross.